started. If my computer says that it's one o'clock, so my name is Amy Whitaker, and I'm the marketing manager with Bedford St. Martin's for History. And this, uh, the new ideas in teaching series, is something that we've kicked off to just give people an opportunity to share ideas about the way that they teach a wide variety of history courses. Today, we're going to be talking about the U.S. History Survey course. And we're, we always have some, some moderators. Most often they are authors of ours, so they're friends and people we work with closely. And today we have with us the authors of a, one of our U.S. survey books, Exploring American Histories, and uh, that's Nancy Hewitt and Stephen Lawson, and they are both at Rutgers. Um, so they're going to be um, talking about integrating original documents, and we'd love as much as possible to make this a conversation. So. Um, Every what we can all hear each other. So please feel free to just, you know, chime in, ask questions. We'll stop occasionally and ask for questions and comments or feedback um, because you know we're all still learning from each other. So we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to either voice their questions or give us some feedback or you know propose their own ideas. Whatever you've got to say, we're you know we'd really like it to be as interactive and as much a discussion as possible. So just chime on in. Um, there is a chat feature if you would like to, um, you know, if you would like to type your question in, you just go down to the right-hand panel. You should be able to see that. Um, but, you know, no need. We're a fairly small group today, so please just, you know, say, excuse me, I've got something to say, and we'll be happy to, to, to pause and, and listen to you. So with that, uh, let's get started. I'm going to turn this over now to Nancy uh, Hewitt and to Stephen Lawson. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Stephen Lawson, and I'm here today with uh, my wife and colleague, Nancy Hewitt. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, together, we have more than 70 years' experience teaching American history surveys in diverse institutions. And we want to talk to you, uh, with you today about various ways that we have integrated primary source documents into our classes. To give you a sense of the diversity of students we've taught, uh, you can see a list of the various schools in which one or both of us have held positions from community colleges to research universities. Like many of you, we face challenges in integrating documents into our American History Survey courses. We want to highlight two challenges today. The challenge of getting students to critically engage visual and textual documents, and the challenge of introducing multiple perspectives with overwhelming, without overwhelming students with too many documents. Over the course of our careers, the number of topics and themes incorporated into American history service, the survey courses has expanded dramatically as historians of women, workers, Indians, African Americans, and immigrants have introduced an astonishing array of topics, events, and interpretations. These diverse perspectives have made history come alive for many students who never imagined that people like themselves helped create change. But integrating these stories with narratives of major political, economic, and military developments can be challenging. We have brought these multiple perspectives to life through primary sources that give voice to the experiences of Americans from all walks of life, from powerful political and economic elites to slaves, farmers, industrial workers, political activists, wartime nurses and soldiers, etc. We have also used brief biographies to set the stage for a particular period of development. For instance, Nancy introduces the period following the American Revolution through the lives of future Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton and disaffected war veteran and farmer Daniel Shays. And I've introduced discussions of urbanization and immigration at the turn of the 20th century through the lives of Nancy's grandmother, Mary Vick from Hungary, and my grandfather, 
Beryl Lassen from Russia, whose photographs you now see. Not only do we encourage students to see that people, like our grandparents, who are not well known, have made history, but that their descendants, as well as our, ours, have played a role in shaping and reflecting the past. We think that students learn history most effectively when they feel connected to the past, which means reading historians' interpretations in conjunction with diverse primary sources. Sources bring the past to life in ways that narrative alone cannot. While narrative offers the necessary framework, context, and chronology that documents by themselves do not typically provide. So, to address the challenges noted above, we've selected a few examples that highlight various ways that we can help students engage with the diverse sources that historians use and through carefully crafted document projects explore multiple perspectives. In both cases, we also want to encourage students to make connections between these documents and the larger themes of the course. Now, Nancy is going to talk briefly about annotated documents, using examples from early American history, and then we'll take some time to discuss your ideas, suggestions, and questions before moving on to examples of comparative documents and document projects that cover other time periods and topics. I wanted to begin with uh, this image, which now appears in several textbooks and is often used on, well, in my early days overheads and now on PowerPoint to illustrate lectures usually on the early settlement of Virginia. For many years, I presented this engraving of Pocahontas to students and explained to them what I thought made this 1616, 1617 engraving particularly useful in capturing the collision between American Indian and English societies. But I was never quite convinced that they were as intrigued by the image as I was. So then I began asking my students what they saw in the engraving. And some students offered quite astute comments. For instance, uh, a student would almost always notice the ornate costume that Pocahontas is wearing uh, and would wonder how that's linked to her role as either the daughter of an Indian chief uh, in the Americas or the wife of a wealthy Englishman. But other students weren't really sure what to look for or where to begin. So I began asking more specific questions about the image, like those offered to the left of the engraving, and then ended with a question like the one at the bottom that helped students place this image in the larger context of the themes of the lecture or discussion or textbook chapter. Uh, so for instance, one of the questions, the, the very first question is about the fact that most elite women whose portraits were drawn would have been looking down or looking away uh, from the viewer, but in this uh, engraving by a Dutch uh, artist, Simon van der Paas, he actually has Pocahontas looking directly uh, at the viewer, and so what does this tell us about the way either Pocahontas thought about herself or about the way the artist uh, thought about her perhaps differently than he would have thought about English royalty. One of the great benefits that I discovered with this approach of using these kind of more specific questions was that when I guided students more directly through an analysis of this portrait, it prepared many of them to look more critically at other portraits in the textbook or on PowerPoint uh, that were used later in the class. And I wanted to give just one more quick example of an annotated document. This one is called The Drunkard's Home. It's an illustration from the National Temperance Offering, which was circulated by the Sons and Daughters of Temperance in 1850. Documents like this often appear in textbook chapters on antebellum religion and reform, and students are often very interested in campaigns against alcohol, which seem to speak directly to what many of them are dealing with in their own lives. Um, I find it useful to use uh, questions with this image to direct students to specific aspects of the illustration, and then a final question again, like the one at the bottom, that relates back to the larger themes of the course. 
And I've used this particular image to engage students in a brief discussion in the midst of my large lecture course at Rutgers. So I'll put this up on the PowerPoint and ask them uh, to analyze different aspects of this image. Uh, but it can also be used for more in-depth explorations in smaller classes that emphasize discussion uh, more than lecture. And in that situation, students can respond to the questions that appear on the document in more depth. Uh, but I've also asked students in smaller discussion sections to consider how key figures in the period that's being studied might have responded to the in this image. So for instance, how might the evangelical minister, Charles Grandison Finney, react to this scene? Or women's rights advocate, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, or inventor and anti-immigrant crusader, Samuel F. B. Morse, or legislators in Maine who were debating prohibition laws in 1850-51, or maybe even members of the Shoemakers Union. I think questions like this can help students see how a single document can illuminate diverse issues in the antebellum North and link reform movements to larger religious, political, and economic development. So uh, at this point, we wanted to take a break from our talking and ask you if you had used questions like this to guide students in their interpretations of documents or how, my, or how you might use these or similar documents in your classes. Does anyone have any thoughts or want to talk about the different ways that they have used um, documents in their class? Uh, I'll start. Uh, this is John Glenn. I teach at St. Louis Community College. Uh, I taught for 16 years at Principia College, and now I'm teaching. Now I'm the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at St. Louis Community College. One of my favorites uh, is a book, is a, a picture called uh, um, the. I think it's the Cost of Blood or something like that by um, T. S. Noble, and it shows three men. Uh, a planter on the far right dressed in a smoking jacket and slippers, and then a table and a guy standing behind the table, and he's counting money. He's a slave dealer. And then there's a mulatto slave on the far left. And if you look closely, the mulatto slave is actually the son of the planter. And so I asked the students, okay, who's this guy on the right? Who's this guy in the middle? Who's this guy on the left? And they kind of get those. And then we talk about the familial relationship that the mulatto slave has uh, on the left with the planter on the right and what that does to the wife of the planter when she sees a mulatto slave and what that does to the mother of the mulatto slave when she sees the planter or her son. And then I ask them to title the painting. Um, and they come up with some interesting titles. The best one I ever heard is, Thanks a Lot, Dad. <laughs> That's a great example. A great I really example. Yeah, yeah. I love example. that. And I think that that uh, what you were just describing about asking students the relationship among the relationships among people in the illustration or in the painting or in a photograph, and then also thinking about people from the outside, like the mother of that slave. Uh, is a great way to get students really engaged with these documents that might at first seem quite unfamiliar and distant to them, just because they're more used to you know photographs and Facebook. And but it's a great way to draw them into that document. Other ideas, other documents, questions about these documents. Okay, we can move on. All right, so we're going to move on to some comparative documents. Uh, and again, this is a common way in which textbooks present primary sources to students uh, through compar comparisons between two documents addressing the same issue from different perspectives. This reinforces the importance of attending to multiple voices, uh, but in a lot of books, every comparison is framed as oppositional pro and anti-slavery, civil rights advocates versus the KKK or white supremacists. And of course, we know that comparisons can be more nuanced and complicated than simple opposition. The example shown here, which relates to battles over Western lands following the American Revolution, pairs 
1786 journal entry by General Richard Butler, an emissary from the new Confederation government of the U.S. to the Shawnee Indians, with a 1786 address to the U.S. Congress from a Pan-Indian Council. Although these documents certainly indicate clear differences in the sense of power held by each side in negotiations over Western lands, they also reflect more subtle distinctions about the process of negotiation itself, with Butler arguing for unilateral submission of individual Indian nations to the U.S. government and the Pan-Indian Council suggesting a reconciliation between the new U.S. government and a much larger group of Indian nations within the Ohio River Valley. One of the most surprising responses I've gotten to using these documents in class, and it happens nearly every time I teach them, is disbelief by some students that Indians would or could have written to the U.S. Congress at all. Either they think of Indians in this period as illiterate, or at least as unable to speak or write English, or they assume that Indians were only victims of Anglo-American conquest, or they imagine that all conflicts between Indians and the United States were military in nature, were armed conflicts. But once students have read the sources and responded to the questions about them in this comparison, I think they gain a new view of the agency that some Indians claimed in this period, which then transforms their sense of the development of Indian-U.S. relations over the following decades to realize that this wasn't just a story of U.S. domination of American Indian nations, although ultimately, of course, many of them were dominated or removed, but that this was really a struggle between sovereign Indian nations, pan-Indian groups, and the U.S. government. And there's a later comparison I do that also points out the disagreements among Americans about what U.S. Indian policy was. Uh, I want to show you one more comparison relating to the early 20th century uh, that focuses on the changing views of one person, W.E.B. Du Bois, who shifts his position on African American support for U.S. policies and practices between July 1918, during World War I, and May 1919, in the war's immediate aftermath. Here, students are directed to consider why Du Bois was so insistent that black Americans close ranks with white Americans during the war, and then why he's so appalled at the treatment of returning soldiers after the war. By locating these documents in the context of America's place in the world in the late 19th, early 20th century, I think students can think more critically about the relationship between developments on the home front and the nation's expanding global ambitions. And one of the reasons I love this comparison is that it reminds students that not only do people disagree with each other, evidenced by the more typical comparison between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, but that they can also change their positions, positions as historical events unfold. For some students, at least, they begin to see historical figures as more dynamic, as individuals who you know, much like us, change views over time or in relation to new circumstances or information. So I wondered how many of you use these kind of comparative documents to engage your students, uh, and again, whether any of you have examples of comparisons that you think have worked particularly well in your courses. Anybody have any ideas about comparative documents or examples they'd like to share with the group? I mean, is this something you would normally you or you? I think you, we see them in a lot of textbooks now. I know when I first started teaching, I didn't see them that often, but now it feels like a lot of textbooks have one set of comparisons uh, either at the end of the chapter uh, or at the middle, although as I said, most of them are kind of oppositional. Uh, and then sometimes I think students think that the only way that you can compare views is adversarial. Uh, I, I can give an example. Excellent. Who is who's uh, speaking? <laughs> I'm Professor Bennett, uh, at Venice University of Health Sciences, used to be Florida Hospital College. 
Um, in, in some textbooks, uh, for example, uh, they would use, instead of comparing uh, different points of views at that precise time and moment, you can see a comparison between a person's point of view in the 19th century and a person's point of view in the 21st century. An example is the comparison, using the term philanthropy, comparing uh, Andrew Carnegie's view on philanthropy and Warren Buffett's view mm -hmm. on philanthropy. And that is a good comparison, not only because it's, it's using two well-known figures, but it's using figures across time. And I think that also gives an important point of view for students how one term, philanthropy, or you could use any other terms, how it was used then and how it's used now. Right. Yeah, and it's, I think sometimes that can really help students see the importance of the debates that were going on in an earlier century by pointing out the way that it's uh, mirrored in our own time. Absolutely. I mean, Professor Bennett's um, uh, comment makes me think just immediately of the word uh, or the concept liberal or liberalism and how it mm -hmm. would have been used. In That's the, correct. Yeah. Do you do that? Do you do that also in 19th century? Yes. Because, yes. Yeah. That, also, that's, a, that's valid. Yeah, because that's a very difficult concept since uh, most of the students we get in classes these days have grown up with liberal as a, uh, you know, a kind of pejorative term. And uh, they don't quite understand the origins of it and then its transformation. So that's a great idea. Yeah, I also find that when I'm teaching the coming of the Civil War, the Civil War, and talking about the Republican Party, mm -hmm. that students are thinking of the modern Republican Party, and mm -hmm. they're often confused about <laughs> that the Republican Party in the Civil War era seems to be the progressive party in terms of racial issues, and that's not what they're used to. So again, I think, yes, making those comparisons across time can be very helpful. Any other uh, kind of examples of this? This is John Glenn again. Uh, yesterday I was teaching the Constitution, and I had two com competing visions up between Brutus and Publius from the Federalist Papers, and I was asking, the, I asked the students to read them off the board, uh, off the um, the screen up in front, and I had one student read paragraph one and one student read paragraph two and work my way through it that way. And then I asked some of the other students, well, which one seems the most compelling, Brutus's view or Publius' view? And we got into a good discussion uh, about whether uh, states should have the rights and, or the federal government should have the rights, and then we morphed that into the uh, recent election, uh, selection by Colorado and Washington of uh, making smoking marijuana legal and how that's in violation still of a federal law and what's going to go on there, the concept between federalism and state power, and it went pretty well. Yes, yeah, yeah, that sounds very great. interesting. How many uh, students would you have in a class like that? Oh, uh, 20, roughly 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's I, I, I also like the idea of reading parts of the documents out loud, having students read them out loud. I've done that even in a big lecture course, and it definitely makes students attend more closely when it's something that another student is saying sometimes than when it's just <laughs> listening to me who's already been lecturing for an hour. And you know what's amazing, too, uh, in a small class of 20, um, when you call on a student to read, the good students read well and the poor students read poorly. And that's a, a generalization that holds true in all my classes. And I can pick out, okay, um, I just had Gloria read, and she did a great job. She's probably a pretty good student. And then Billy read, and he stumbled over virtually every other word. Uh, okay, I'm going to have some challenges with Billy. That's a good assessment uh, technique as well, I think, is what you're saying. Um, it is. Yeah, great. Um, we want to move on to a, another kind of uh, use of documents, which uh, we've incorporated in our teaching, and it's... it's um, kind of transformed over the years and evolved over the years, and that is uh, what we call document projects. Um, in effect, it would be the use of a series to help our students appreciate the diversity of American histories. 
we've developed a number of these uh, document projects over the years. They, we intend to introduce students to different types of sources and to multiple perspectives on an issue central to a particular period or region. In general, we found that using too many documents in a single project can overwhelm many students who find them difficult to read and digest. So we've created projects that introduce multiple voices with just five or six well-chosen sources, which allows students to engage more fully and develop, we hope, their own analysis. Document projects can provide a capstone for a particular section of the course. Uh, they flow out of class lectures and chapter narratives and relate directly to a major issue in these presentations. Uh, the emphasis here really is uh, on the idea of a project that forms an integrated unit of learning. For, for example, in, on the screen, you see in a section of the American History II survey on cities, immigrants, and the nation, uh, I created a document project that asks students to evaluate the popular conception of American society in the 20th century as a melting pot where immigrants from diverse backgrounds absorbed American values, language, dress, and tastes over time. Uh, which, of course, is the traditional way students are educated to think about the history of American immigration. But as an alternative to the melting pot analogy, I suggest vegetable soup. Uh, and this concept came to me just spontaneously many years ago from uh, teaching this uh, to this lesson. And I presented it to the students in that class, and it, 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 it actually um, resonated very well uh, with them. But the concept comes from an everyday item familiar to students, and I ask them how it describes the American immigrant experience more accurately than the melting pot. Well, they had a, enough information in the textbook I was using at the time to figure out that although immigrants do assimilate to make up a common broth, they remain as distinct and identifiable as the individual vegetables in the liquid part of the soup. And I did this first in a college I was teaching in in New York City where a lot of the kids had immigrant backgrounds. But it still works today because we've had a new wave of immigrants and uh, they also come from immigrant backgrounds. So in other words, from this very simple image, of vegetable soup, and sometimes I bring in a can of Campbell's vegetable soup, they, they figure out the more complicated notion of cultural pluralism. And they get it more easily because, as I said, many of them were first or second generation Americans themselves, the product of a new wave of immigrants now since 1965. Um, the project that I want to discuss with you furnishes a variety of sources to engage students now in exploring the reactions of Americans, both older generations and newcomers, to the wave of immigration to the cities at the turn of the American century. The first one that is on the screen now, it offers an excerpt from a play, from the play by Israel Zangwill, who was a Jewish immigrant from England, who actually coined the term melting pot. That was the name of the play. If you look closely, you can see uh, what we see in the document is not often well, what we remember. And that is Zangwill actually argued that the melting pot was God's crucible intended to make a culture of supermen. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, how might you explain to your class why this version of history that uh, Zangwill was presenting became so popular? which is what I try to do. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, from the little bit you can see, uh, particularly in that uh, first major paragraph, uh, do you see, I can compare it to what I see, <laughs> uh, do you see uh, things in there that might suggest why melting pot 
uh, caught on and has really become, despite much historical research to the contrary, it still becomes the foundational view of looking at the American immigration experience. Anybody have thoughts on that? Well, I may be overreaching. You can tell me if I am. You can interrupt me. <laughs> um, but the way I try to explain it in part, and, I, and again, the first time I actually read the document rather than reading it, reading about it in the text, you know, the melting pot, when I actually read what he said, it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, his use of God and his destiny uh, really fits in with American cultural traditions from the very beginning of its uh, historical foundation of divine providence, that America is a, is a country blessed by God, and in fact, established by God, and this is the Puritans' version of creating a city upon the hill, and later in the 19th century, uh, God's will in the form of manifest destiny. And what Zangle was trying to do clearly was to, in his case, take this further by, uh, to legitimize immigration by, at that time, non-Protestants and non-English speaking people. But he's doing it in a way that fits in with the American cultural um, uh, foundation. And uh, then, I, am sure, okay. I am sure that some of your students may argue that uh, the, the inclusion of, of both Anglo-Saxons and non-Anglo-Saxons may have been a, a, a debate because that was not the, the thought. That it was the thought that Anglo-Saxons were different from non-whites, and he's saying we're all together in the same part. That may also bring about a good debate or discussion in the class. Yeah, yeah well, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, as you can see, we build on this. So here's someone who's talking about the melting pot, and then you, we, we introduce students um, a second document, which appeared in a magazine called Judge, which was a you know, fairly popular magazine in, in the 1890s. This one comes from 1893. And it, 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 it's uh, entitled, the very top you see, Be Just Even to John Chinaman which, of course, today we'd see as a derogatory term, then it wasn't so much. But although this cartoon it was meant to support a renewal, the first renewal of the Chinese Exclusion Act of the 1880s, which, of course, barred Chinese from immigrating into the country, if you look at it closely, at least if I look at it closely, and again, this is what makes these documents so valuable, because they, they may lend themselves to complexity and nuance. If you look at it closely, it seems more complex. For instance, it's not just an anti-immigrant uh, cartoon, which you might think at first, even though clearly the Chinese are targeted here, because if you look in the background, as, as, as you know, Lady Liberty is pushing the Chinese man out, look who's left in the classroom. Um, you know, you've got... Native Americans, African Americans, uh, Irish Americans, all sorts of Americans who were not, except for the uh, American Indian, clearly, not native to the United States. Um, students love these cartoons, so it's relatively easy to gain their attention. Uh, so the, and the question then focuses in trying to figure out the nuances. Uh, why do these other immigrants belong, why do they remain, but the Chinese man does not? I mean, I, I'm offering that question to you uh, to think as if you were your own students. Uh, how would you explain the fact that there's one particular kind of immigrant that's being, you know, pushed out and not ready for the, uh, for Americanism while the others seem to have been Americanized? Any ideas on that? that uh, I mean, one possibility, and this is a possibility, take a look at the first row 
of uh, the, the, the people who are remaining. Um, there's, a, there's a guy who I think, if, if you could see this more closely, you would see he's supposedly an Irishman. And he's holding up a sign, a blackboard it looks like, and on the sign, I don't know if you can see it, but on the sign it says, he kick out the heathen. He's got no vote. And then they're throwing him out. Does, does that uh, offer any clue that you might think about? Well, most of, most of the groups that came had some Christian background. Mm -hmm. uh, Irish, of course. Uh, Germans, of course. Uh, French, of course, British, of course, but the Chinese were not part of that Christian tradition. So it was easier to pick on the Chinese. Of course, they had been excluded already, but they didn't have that Christian background that helped them meld with the other groups. Mm -hmm. The other groups may have been from different places, but they could have certain things in common. Yeah. And then African Americans were already here, so you can argue that Africans were just coming over so I think that's that's one of the reasons yeah. we even think the Chinese out. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because clearly, as you said, Africans were not Christians, but for some, they they were Christianized, and American right. Indians were not Christian, but they were also Christianized. But for some reason, at least in 1893, for for whatever reason, Chinese folk at that point it didn't seem that they could be Christianized. Of course, later they would be, but at that particular moment in time. They were still viewed as heathens or non non Christians. And then the other part of it, he's got no vote. Uh, of course, American Indians didn't have the vote either. But African Americans didn't have African -American. Well, they, they, they had either. lost the vote by yeah. this point, although not entirely. Yeah. But the vote, and, and it's interesting that the Irishman would say that because, as you would see later in any chapter on uh, cities, the Irish had been here long enough to begin to take over. Amer American city government and would use the vote with other immigrants to try to keep themselves in power. So it's a, the point is it, it, it can tell you a lot of different things if you, if you push students to look into it. The third document and, and actually the fourth document are uh, overlapping here and they can be part of, of two sides of the coin. Uh, one is a, is a very um, typical uh, book Race or mongrel, you can tell you know, what the author is thinking, the author Albert P. Schultz in 1908. Um, he sees the decline of American culture and political institutions as threatened by immigration from Southern and Southeastern Europe, mainly, of course, Catholic and, pro and Jewish. Schultz considers these people as an inferior race, and, and they are called races and denounces the idea of the melting pot. He doesn't like the melting pot because he sees it as a form of miscegenation. And he uses, instead of saying miscegenation, which applies to black and white usually, he uses the word fusion, and that is uh, uh, that's, uh, degraded, according to him. Uh, from this excerpt, I think students can see the uses of race to cover more broadly what today we would call ethnic groups. So in other words, back in the early 19th century, what we today see as ethnic groups were seen as races. So there was an Italian race, a Hungarian race, a Jewish race, and so forth. Um, this opens the opportunity, I think, for a discussion of the fact that race is socially constructed. Uh, human beings construct the notion of race. That is, race is a cultural rather than a bio biological characteristic, which is a very modern concept, and I think this gives us opportunities to at least uh, touch on that. And, and this document by Schultz can be contrasted by one uh, by Randolph Bourne, which was written in 1916 and is a, was an article in the Atlantic Monthly. It's not quite a defense of the melting pot, and maybe it's an early version of vegetable soup. Born defends, in very specific terms and modern term ways, the foreign-born and their descendants. Not just those from Western Europe, uh, but from Southeastern and, and, and uh, Southern Europe, 
as the source of the strength of the United States. And he calls American culture transnational, which is a very modern term. And this was written in 1916. And he praises America as a cosmopolitan land and not the decadent place that Schultz envisioned. And then you can follow this by uh, the final document here, and that's uh, you know, one by Jacob Rees, who's, who's associated in a way as a reformer of I immigrant culture, particularly in New York City, is How the Other Class, How the Other Half Lives, his 1891 book with photographs, offer, offers an account of uh, the conditions in which immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe are forced to live in New York City. But what's surprising and, and kind of very interesting here, because it's counter- uh, historical in many ways, is that Rees, in this particular account, describes the African-American population of New York City, which in 1890 is really at the beginning, the very, very early beginnings of the migration, which would become a great migration in the, in the early 20th uh, century and World War I period. Uh, he, he compares African-Americans with um, the other immigrant population, uh, what he calls the lowest of whites, Italian, Poles, and Jews. And he compares African Americans very, very favorably um, as maintaining standards of high cleanliness and uh, good manners and all sorts of things of that. And I found this a good way to show that even a reformer, even someone sympathetic to improving immigrant lives had his own multiple views of immigrants, particularly Southern and Eastern European, and he felt a variety of emotions about them. And then finally, um, although you can analyze each individual document, the, 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 the sum is greater than its individual parts. And so we create questions that ask the students, uh, at, at, at a particular point, after they've read the documents and discussed them, we've asked them to go in and, in some cases, compare them uh, to each other, as well as to put them into a larger coherent whole. And there's a final question, which we call put it in context. It asks the students, in this case, to come up with their own metaphor that explains American immigrant history. And I've had students offer beef stew, and salad bowl, and then we discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these images as they apply to the documents. But perhaps the most interesting response I ever received came from a student in New York City who himself was from a recent immigrant group, he happened to be Puerto Rican, who one day came into class shortly after we had some discussion of this story, and he gave me a handwritten cartoon that he had done, and he drew the pretty much a stick figure, but the Statue of Liberty, and on the base of the Statue of Liberty, he included Emma Lazarus's inspiring words, give me your tired, your poor. He had etched them on the base, and then the caption for this was simply, boy, we're prohibited by law. Hmm. I mean, very poignant. He got it. He got it right on, and I, at that time, photocopied it and would pass it out to my students and have them uh, commented on it. Uh, given the current debates over immigration reform, uh, this kind of project, which I've just uh, discussed, is rooted in the experience of an earlier century, is nonetheless very, very contemporary. Well, we've created these kinds of document projects for our class over many years and incorporated them in the docu textbook that we have written called Exploring American Histories. And we've put them at the end of each chapter. And we, we've given you a list of just six out of 29, or five, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we meant six, but there was, wasn't enough space. But we've given you five out of 29 document projects, and then we have another 29 alternate document projects, uh, ranging from the Boston Massacre 
Civil War letters to McCarthyism and the Hollywood Ten. In part, we hope that incorporating this project along with the annotated, comparative, and other in-text documents that Nancy talked about into our docu-text will address the problem that continues of coordinating documents with textbooks by developing projects that offer different kinds of sources and multiple perspectives, students can not only begin to understand the complicated process of developing historical interpretations, but also participate in the process themselves. Well, we wanted to just uh, end by talking about how to use document projects uh, in different ways, depending on the size of your class and your student ability. So we've just compiled a short list of possibilities that we've tried in lecture courses with teaching assistants, medium-sized classes of 40 to 60, and smaller groups of 25 or fewer. I think even in the largest of classes, students can be asked to read these document projects and ones like them ahead of time since they're fairly limited in number and then can be used for in-class discussion to break up a longer lecture and engage as many students as who are willing to participate as possible. Uh, and if your large lecture is accompanied by weekly discussion sections, then projects like this could be a great way to focus those discussions, uh, especially if you're using teaching assistance, it's a great way to get teaching assistance uh, to give them some clear direction about how to use their discussion sections. In small and medium-sized classes, I've used them as the basis for small group projects uh, in a variety of ways, but uh, for instance, having different groups of students prepare a particular point of view and then choose a representative of their group to participate in a panel discussion or a debate. So in the document project, Stephen just talked about the question could be something like, do immigrants threaten the cultural and economic health of the country? Uh, and then have students using make their arguments based on the documents from the project. Of course, they could be used for an in-class writing assignments, the annotated documents, the comparative documents, document projects, a take-home essay, uh, an exam question. And they could also serve as the basis for discussions in chat rooms or other online assignments, although to tell you the truth, I've never used a chat room. I use a Sakai site, but I haven't used the chat room, but I know some of my younger colleagues do. Uh, so we think there are a whole variety of ways, and as some of you have already suggested from your comments, you've figured out other interesting ways to use documents to really engage these students in active learning and to get them to think about the multiple voices within the American experience in a particular time and also over time. So do you have any questions, discussions, comments, things that we could respond to about how you use, how you have used documents or how uh, we might um, help you think through how you use documents? Uh, this is John Glenn again. I have a comment and a question. I love your idea about putting things in context. I know I was having my students analyze documents uh, a few years ago, and they were just pretty not very good. And now I have them doing a three-part document analysis. The first part is they have to paraphrase the document. That is, what are the arguments that the author is putting forward without, or without as many as possible, the use of quotations from the document itself. That is, put it in their own words. And then the second part is they have to put it in context why was he doing this? And then thirdly, what's your reaction to it? And that's on a one-page document that they do almost every week. But my question for you is, when you ask pointed questions of either the class or specific individual students, and they respond with, I don't know, then what's your best uh, response to that? I've actually... One of the reasons I started doing small group projects is that initially when I would use some of these documents in front of a larger class or even a class of 20, uh, either no one was willing to speak up or the students who spoke up didn't really have any idea <laughs> what, 
what the document <laughs> was about. So that didn't work too well. So then I would break them up into smaller groups, and I found even if I had them just talk to a couple of people across the aisle from them, if it was a classroom where it wasn't easy to put the desks in a circle or something, that just talking with three or four students together about the document and then having them respond, I would get much better responses. I almost okay. felt as though it was like they were afraid to, to come up with their own idea for fear they would say something completely wrong. Or And, and I've also realized, as I'm sure many of you have, that you have to be very flexible, uh, that if a student comes up with does respond to that question and comes up with something that seems a little off target, that sometimes you can still bring it back to uh, a point that's important that you want to make in the class and try to engage because the more positive feedback you give them initially about working with documents, the more willing they are to speak up later. Uh, but it is, uh, it is hard sometimes to get them engaged. But I do think putting, putting them in small groups or having them just talk to one or two other students for a few minutes can improve the discussion enormously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in Thanks, small, Nancy. I'll try it. Yeah, in small but, groups too. And it seems like you have the kind of class with 20 students. If you if you have four groups of five students each, that's a perfect uh, perfect size. And if you walk around the room and just monitor it a bit, you you can get you can make sure that all of the students are participating. It's not just one or two people who's driving the subgroup. And uh, then the other three just, you know, latch on to it. <laughs> Which uh, also happens. So walking around, <laughs> not being obtrusive, but walking around just to know, just to let them know that you are, you know, paying some attention. And um, I do like the idea of paraphrasing. I think that's a that's great a one to make one. sure that they understand what the document is essentially about. And, you know, particularly in pre-Civil War, but also in a bit of post-Civil War history, the documents are not always easy to understand because they're written in a different style, a different language. Uh, in effect, so you you it does help to paraphrase it. That's a that's a very good uh, good idea. Any other um, uh, com comments or, or and or questions? I mean, are these documents that you could see yourself using in in classes that you now teach? I like to s several of your ideas with the documents. Uh, and especially, yeah, a, a bunch of them. I was just teaching the Boston Massacre, and we looked at two or three different documents, uh, and that was very interesting. And I, I like the teenagers, uh, the post-war teenagers as also, because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, yeah, that's something that's... Yeah, two of our favorites. Yeah, two of our favorites. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they can kind of, being teenagers, well, depends where you're teaching, but a lot of them of traditional age are still at least when they take a survey course, probably teenagers. So. <laughs> not, not too much older. It, right. uh, makes sense. Well, John, we'll make sure you get a copy of Nancy and Stephen's book so that you can delve into all of them and, and see all the different document projects and see if they're useful to you. Great. Thank you. Sir, uh, we know this is getting to the end of the time and that most of you have very busy schedules, so we don't want to uh, take any extra time out of your day, but thank you so much for participating, and please stay in touch with us and email us if you have other thoughts or questions or comments. Uh, we'd be happy to be in email discussions with you as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, these documents, you can use our ideas, but you're free, of course, to adapt it. That's the whole beauty yeah. of using uh, documents. These are not carved uh, in stone. So. Uh, thank you for your comments and feedback, and we've really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Thanks a whole lot, Thanks. everyone, and we'll be. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.